Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, my name is Elizabeth Hansberg. I uh, co-founded and direct People for Housing Orange County. We are the YIMBY group for Orange County. And I'm really grateful and pleased to introduce Paul Anderson. Um, Paul is a architect with TCA Architects. He specializes in um, housing, designing housing. And um, he's also a lifelong resident of Orange County. So he has a lot to say um, on how to do uh, density in suburbia, which is what this webinar is about. So Paul, I will turn it over to you with my gratitude for your willingness to spend your evening with us. Absolutely, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks everybody for joining in. Um, so as Elizabeth said, I am an architect uh, here in Orange County. Um, I am actually a, uh, uh, a lifelong resident of Fullerton. I've lived here my whole life. Um, and so uh, when I went to school to become an architect, uh, my primary motivation for doing that was housing. Uh, I feel very strongly about housing. I always have. Um, I feel like I get to meet a basic need for people. You know, we, everyone, needs, um, everyone needs food, uh, everyone needs clothing, everyone needs shelter. And I get to uh, help provide shelter for people. And so I even know I have uh, friends that I went to school with that uh, do great big projects, you know, civic buildings or hospitals or schools. Um, I've always been very passionate about housing and I've done that now for uh, over 25 years. So um, I thought it'd be fun tonight to go through a case study uh, of a project that we have under construction here in Fullerton to um, kind of explain the process of, of how things develop and, and why they develop. But um, you know, before I kind of go into that, um, I wanted to kind of give a little preamble about why I think housing is so important. So I'm gonna share my screen. Do, 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 do. So we can, you can look at something else besides me. So, um, so in 2017, there was a study that was done that said conservatively, there was 1.8 million people uh, that needed new housing by the year 2025. And, uh, you know, we build housing, uh, what's called a housing unit at a current rate of about uh, 80,000 units a year. A housing unit is just simply something that you live in. It can be a single family house. It can be an apartment unit, uh, it can be anything in between, but um, we produce about 80,000 housing units a year. Uh, but in order to meet that demand by 2025, we would, we would need to be building uh, 100,000 additional housing units to meet that need. So it'd be 180,000 housing units a year, more than double what we're producing. Uh, we have not been doing that so um, we are just creating a larger and larger deficit uh, of housing uh, that we need here in California. Um, we would actually need, if you feel like apartments uh, are too expensive or housing costs are too crazy in California, uh, we would need to actually quadruple the amount of housing that we are producing each year in order to lower prices. Uh, it's pretty staggering. There's a lot of reasons why that doesn't happen and uh, we could certainly talk about those in a Q&A time if you'd like, but um, um, you know, California has been experiencing a housing shortage since the 1970s. This has been going on for quite a while and it's a pretty basic problem. It's a supply and demand problem. Um, we don't build enough houses for people. And so, you know, for every five jobs that we create in, uh, in California, we build one housing unit on average. And so we're just not building enough and so there's a real need to do uh, higher density housing and there's a, a real need to do higher density housing correctly. So um, I want a little history lesson. Let's uh, briefly talk about uh, the suburban model. Um, it's the 1950s, a typical 1950s suburban neighborhood. Um, back in the 1950s, there was about 10 and a half million people that lived in California. Um, that was actually up about 52% from the 1940s. Um, but in the 1950s, we were coming out of the war. And so we had a lot of, um, a lot of vets that were wanting to come and, um, and start a normal life, you know, get married, start a family, buy a house. And uh, so the idea was, is that we are going to create this affordable housing uh, outside of the economic centers 
and uh, we're gonna build them in the green fields, right? But it's gonna be great. It's gonna make housing more affordable. And in order to get people from their house to work and back, we're gonna create this amazing thing, you know, called uh, freeways, right? We're gonna have this amazing um, interconnectivity via highways and freeways. It's gonna get people from point A to point B and back really quickly. And, and it's gonna be a beautiful, wonderful thing. Uh, but then, you know, we, we cut to uh, today um, in the 20, you know, 2020 and um, our connectivity is a little more crowded. Um, this, I'll, I'll admit, this is not, uh, this is not California. This is actually New Delhi, but I love the image because I've sat on the 57 um, in traffic that certainly felt like this. But, um, you know, we, today we have, um, it'll be estimated with this new census that we'll be at 40 million people in California in 2020. Um, and what's happening is that we are building um, homes further and further away from the economic centers. Um, this is causing then more traffic on these interconnected highways. Uh, it's causing more time away from the home. Uh, there's studies that are done about the uh, health implications of, of uh, being in traffic uh, for so long. And, um, and so there just needs to be a better model to uh, help to alleviate these things. So um, I don't know if I can do this. Um, Elizabeth, you can tell me if I can or not, but um, you know, there's a lot of, there's typically, there's uh, a lot of misconceptions about multifamily housing. And um, um, Elizabeth, you tell me if this is okay, but if, if people want to unmute themselves and give an example of what they think might be a, a misconception of, uh, of multifamily housing, uh, I'd be interested to kind of hear what your thoughts are on that. Absolutely, that sounds like a great idea. Okay, so you'll have to, go ahead, if you wanna speak, go ahead and unmute yourself and throw out what you think might be a, a common misconception of why multifamily housing is bad or doesn't work uh, in, in the suburban environment. Well, a lot of people say that multifamily housing will add to traffic because more people will be living in the same space. Yeah, that, I, I have heard that. And uh, that is uh, definitely an argument that people make. I think that's a, that's a valid one, yep. Anyone else have any thoughts? Well, I don't know if it's so much an argument, but that um, it would ruin the character of single, resi single family residential neighborhoods. Mm, I love that. Yes, I've heard that too. <laughs> Um, I would say parking is an issue. Yes. Parking I, would be an issue. That. And then the space that's actually being used by the multifamily group, there weren't there, there actually isn't enough space. You have, you know, a group of eight or ten people living in two or three bedrooms. So yes. the occupancy of the space isn't appropriate for the amount of people living in that space. There you go. I actually didn't put that one on my list, but I do hear that one quite a bit as well. Yeah, these are all these are all great, um, and these are these are very typical arguments that I hear. Um, it's more traffic, uh, it's less available parking. Um, I hear a lot too. It's uh, less desirable people living nearby, and I think that also kind of feeds into the argument that yeah, you'll have ten people living in a in a one bedroom apartment, um, but that's the it's the people that apartments bring uh, that has been. Um, considered an, an issue and that will lower our property values. And so all of your, all of your comments are all arguments that I hear um, pretty much on every uh, city council uh, meeting that I attend that, uh, where I'm presenting a project. Um, I would argue that all of these arguments um, assume that the current resident's way of life is going to negatively change. Um, I mean, that is typically the assumption and, whoops, I've lost my, there we go. Um, and so I like to use, um, I like to use this example of the, um, of the trolley car. And I, I shared this with Elizabeth a few weeks ago when we were talking, but um, I, I find that um, people's fears or concerns on multifamily housing kind of fit into this example where, um, had a, a former employer 
share a story with me where he said he was watching a television program and he said uh, he was watching uh, this program. It was a different country and there was these trolleys uh, going down the street and he said that they were just completely packed with people. And he said there were so many people in the trolley, they were hanging off the sides of the trolley car. And he said that and alongside the trolley, the people were running and they were running to get onto the trolley. But because the trolley was so packed with people, the people that were on the trolley were spitting at the people that were trying to get on and kicking them, trying to keep them away because there was just no room for them. And he said um, he was really struck by one person that had um, made his way kind of through getting spit on and getting hit and kicked. And he was, and he was able to get onto the trolley. And he said he was almost rooting for the guy. And he got onto the trolley and he said, you know, and you would think that that person would have some uh, sort of a sense of compassion for what he had just gone through to kind of get onto this. But he said, but he immediately turned around and started spitting and kicking at the people that were trying to get on the trolley after him. And I find that in kind of in the, I find that in the society that we live in today, that there is a mindset of, I have something and it's very important to me, but if I feel that it's being threatened in any, in any way, shape or form, um, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to prevent that from being taken away or being tainted in some way. And so my, I find in a lot of the arguments that I come into contact with um, when I present a multifamily project, um, are really kind of rooted in selfishness. And, I, and there may be people, you guys may argue with me after the, after the fact, and, and please, you're more than welcome to. Um, but I really do feel that it is a ro rooted in, in, in selfishness, that we have what we have, we have what we want, but we don't necessarily care that our neighbor um, may be struggling to get the same thing. And so um, I believe that um, multifamily um, housing helps to provide a need for people to have that basic right of shelter. Um, you know, we make assumptions that apartments are undesirable. Uh, we make uh, assumptions that housing will be, the housing will be um, uh, undesirable, that everyone uses the same kinds of transportation to get from A to B, and that everyone lives the same way. Um, but in reality, people that live in apartments um, don't necessarily live the same way that people live in uh, single family homes. Uh, there are some differences. And I think that um, there's also a generation of people that look at things a little bit differently than um, the way uh, maybe some of us that are older, like myself, uh, would, would look at them. So, um, so let's kind of, now that I've laid that heavy kind of thing on you guys, <laughs> let's, um, let's go into a case study um, on a project that I have under construction right now in Fullerton that, that did meet a lot of opposition um, when it was going through the, um, the planning process. Uh, I started this project um, in 2015. It is now under construction in 2020. So it does take a while to get these projects up and running. Uh, but this is the uh, former Malahi Chevrolet dealership uh, on Commonwealth. Um, I actually bought my first, car, my first car right next door to this property um, at the Ford dealership when I was a young man. Uh, so these dealerships have been around for a while, but uh, Malahi Chevrolet has actually been out of business uh, for some time. Uh, the buildings are there and had been uh, leased out to other subtenants that were doing auto body repair and some other kind of things. But it was in sad shape and it needed, uh, it needed some love and some attention uh, if it was going to remain. So I'm not going to call it blight, um, but it was, uh, it was in sore need of repair. And... Um, so we started, you know, we always approach a project um, in a way that says we want the project to be site specific. And so, um, you know, when I look at this site, even though I knew this area, and like I said, I bought my first car next door when I was, when I was a young man, um, I know this area well, but I still go through the exercise of, of looking at all these things. So you can see our site there in the middle of the screen it's split by a public street, so it's actually got, it's actually two sites. Um, it's within, uh, you know, a, a quarter mile walk of the, uh, you know, community center and, you know, a little bit further for the public library and city hall. Um, it's, it's a good uh, 
three quarter mile uh, walk to downtown um, and to the, the metro station. And we are obviously adjacent to the train tracks. Um, and so that's a little bit longer of a, of a walk. A lot of people won't walk three quarters of a mile, um, but they will um, take alternate means of transportation. They will ride bikes. Um, uh, they will do uh, electric scooters. Um, they will uh, not necessarily need to get in their car. Some people will take Uber um, to get from point A to point B. Um, but that, that key point of that, that last mile, right, of being able to get from public transportation to your site is uh, something that's very important. We felt that the site was, um, and our, my, uh, my client, uh, the developer, felt that the site was um, a good, in good proximity to a lot of these great amenities of downtown and public transportation that uh, this would fit well. And so um, when I start working on the project, I start interfacing with the city uh, relatively uh, quickly. Um, I review what the city has to say uh, about zoning and uh, what their criteria are. Uh, what was interesting is at the time I was working on this site, there was a, um, there was a zoning that was in place that um, essentially was treating every street the same way. Um, and I, I felt very strongly that that was not the right approach, uh, especially for this area, um, because I have, you know, I have three streets that are wrapping around this site and they all seem to do something differently. And so I uh, met with uh, the city planning director and with my client and I said, I'd like to approach the project this way and I'd like to know what you think about it. And so I said, uh, you know, Commonwealth is a uh, minor arterial street, um, and it uh, really has a public edge. It has, um, you know, commercial buildings along that street. It has homes that have been converted converted into commercial and office space. It has apartments that are on that street. Uh, on the other side of Drake, you've got these one-story apartments. And I said, I would like to treat this as more of my, um, my public edge, where we could bring in retail. Um, or, or uh, retail-like amenity spaces. Um, but I don't believe that I should have retail on, um, on Williamson, which uh, is this green street here. I said, you know, this is a very, um, we're coming from a very residential neighborhood that was at, at, this, uh, at this street at Chestnut was becoming um, a commercial zone. But I mean, when now we're transforming that, I'd like to continue that residential feel down Williamson. And in order to do that, I, I don't want to have a building, long building mass along uh, that street. I want to be able to peel things back and create courtyards and, and have that feeling of um, more movements and more open space, like what you'd see you know, down the street on Williamson between the houses and in front of the houses. But I would like to have a more solid edge along Commonwealth, which seems to fit more with the character of that street. And I said, and then Chestnut with this orange arrows here, you know, that's my, that's my contextual connector. I need to be able to figure out how do I make the transition from something that feels more public to something that feels more residential. And I want to do that on that street. And what was great is that the, um, the, the city was on board. They thought it was uh, a good idea. And so they said, yeah, let's, let's move down that path and explore that. Um, it also help, helps to have a really great client um, that is open to uh, exploration as this client was. And so um, we kind of take it to the next step and we start to mass the building out. So this is uh, just a big four story mass. I just extruded a shape, the shape up that uh, was working with my diagram. And I said, you know, um, I want this, this purple edge along Commonwealth. I want that to be my kind of public edge and, and public amenities. And I'm going to utilize a, a courtyard on Chestnut to start to make a transition between my residential. My residential, I wanted fingers to kind of be popping out uh, into to that street, but not having a big mass so that I could have uh, my courtyards face out to that street. And, and I wanted to try and pull my courtyards through the public street and thought that the city would shoot me down. And uh, they actually loved it. And uh, worked with Public Works on our behalf to allow us to bring in some enhanced paving 
um, along that street to make that happen, to really make that feel like a much larger space. Um, these gray areas are the garages. So this is what's called a wrap building. Uh, it just means that the garages are above grade and my architecture will wrap around them so the garages are hidden. Um, but you're able to drive in and park in a garage in a, on a, each level of the garage. And uh, the idea is that you park on the level that you live on. Uh, but from there, I start looking at, you know, what does the context say? Um, how does it inform the building? And so, you know, the, the blue buildings that are surrounding the site, you know, these are one and two story buildings. And so we wanted to be sensitive to that. So we wanted to start carving away, um, you know, the, our, our building edges in appropriate locations to step down to our neighbors, to not be such a large presence. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are other projects in Fullerton that have been built recently that are, are five stories and more. Um, and I, uh, I just felt like in this neighborhood, in this context, um, a lower scale building made more sense. And uh, so we're three and four stories. Um, and in this corner uh, at Chestnut and Commonwealth, um, we wanted to do something special here. And instead of putting a tower element and making it even taller, we actually stepped down to two stories to relate more with what's going on across the street. So that we wanted to really try and create this, you know, kind of focal point entry from a massing standpoint into, into Chestnut. And then we were able to do the same thing of dropping the massing along these streets and these corners, um, really trying to be respectful to the neighbors around us. Um, and another idea that, that came up as we were working with the city was, you know, how do you make a multifamily building um, feel uh, more residential? And one of the ideas that came up that I loved that was offered up by the city was that um, everybody should have a front door. And uh, now, of course, everyone does have a front door to get into their, their apartment dwelling, but um, on the first floor, everyone can have a front door that faces out to the street. And, you know, the idea of projects like this is that we want them to be um, very walkable and very interconnected. And I love the idea of, of having everybody on the ground floor have a front door, you know, where the, uh, the real estate agent can go and drop their, their little notepad on there. Uh, where the Girl Scouts can come and sell their cookies. Um, all of that to me seems seem like a wonderful idea and it makes it feel more, you know, like a residence. So um, the problem with that is that, you know, we have um, these courtyard spaces that typically would have a pool uh, for the residents or, or something along those lines and those have to be secured. And so oftentimes our courtyards are gated off, which would prevent, um, people that live off of the courtyards from having a front door. And so um, the landscape architect and the city and my client were all very open to coming up with a design that allowed people to get to people's front doors, even in the courtyards by, by fencing things differently um, or doing things a little bit differently than we normally would in order to make that happen. And so uh, in the end, we come up with a, what we call a concept diagram of how we think this building should feel and fit this particular site. And the idea is, is that you can't take this building and plot it someplace else on some other piece of property because it's really been designed to fit within its, its overall context. So at the end of the day, you end up with a, a pretty little site plan like this. Um, you know, we can, you can see that our two build, we have two buildings. We have the, uh, the larger building along Commonwealth. And you can see the garage in the middle uh, that in reality you shouldn't ever see because it's going to be surrounded by these apartment units. Um, you're able to enter in off of Commonwealth uh, into the garage. You're also able to enter in off of Williamson. And then we have another uh, building off of Williamson, which is a more narrow uh, piece of property. And we have a garage that's tucked towards the back by the railroad tracks. And we intentionally designed this building because of the railroad tracks to really kind of um, back onto the building. So we don't necessarily have any residential units that look towards the train tracks. These, these are loud. Uh, so we have our garage up against there, or in this case, we have our residences, but they have the corridor that, um, that gets to your, your front doors that is acting as a buffer 
um, to the train tracks. So your courtyards are actually somewhat protected from the sound of the train, but still open out. And you can see our enhanced paving along Williamson that really starts to make that whole space feel much larger. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I knew and kind of discovered um, on this project is that uh, people will use Williamson as a means to um, bypass Commonwealth. Um, you know, a lot of people will cut down these streets um, to get out to Euclid and uh, ultimately get to the freeway. Um, and so our enhanced paving is actually raised, it's what we call a speed table. And uh, so it's raised up to the level of the uh, curb. So uh, it does slow people down that are coming through the street, which I think is very important when you bring this many people uh, you know, onto, uh, onto a street. You don't want uh, cars kind of screaming down. You're using this as a, a pass through. So it's serving a purpose, uh, but it's also um, creating something of uh, visual interest as you come down the street. Um, so from there, we start to envision, you know, what is this project going to look like? Um, and there are those of us that still draw by hand, believe it or not. And um, so we started envisioning these ideas. And so these are some boards that were put together for a community meeting. But we start to talk about, you know, what is this project going to look like? And um, on Commonwealth, we wanted this project to feel much more horizontal. And because we, again, wanted it to be respectful to our neighbors, we did not want the buildings to feel so tall. Um, we wanted them to kind of feel long and, uh, and low. Um, and we wanted to bring in this, what we called a, um, a boxcar motif to kind of play off the train tracks idea. Um, but we wanted them to not be a static uh, form, but to actually be moving and have movement. So they're a splayed form, like what you see in this image here, but they're all pointing towards downtown and towards the train station. And then they stagger up and down uh, along the building. So you get a lot of movement and a lot of visual interest that's there. And then carving in the, uh, the retail and the resident serving amenities along uh, Commonwealth to um, really create that public edge. And then we utilize the courtyard as that kind of joint to start to make the transition to uh, Williamson, which we wanted to feel more residential. And so with this approach, we said, well, with higher density residential buildings, um, often those buildings are not horizontal, but they, they're more vertical. And so we wanted to have more vertical shapes uh, to the building, and uh, which is the kind of the exact opposite of what we're doing on Commonwealth. And so we wanted to make that transition to something that had a little bit more of a residential feel. And we still pulled in uh, some of these boxcar framed elements, um, but just really to kind of recall what we were doing on the other side of the street to kind of continue that language and so not have them feel so completely separate. And then ultimately we are, we're looking at how does this building fit you know, within that street? And we're doing this at a very conceptual level, but um, you can see that you know, those telephone poles will not be there uh, when the project is built, but um, you can see how tall the telephone poles were um, and how short our building actually uh, is in comparison. Um, you can start to see how this two-story edge, which we're going to be using as an amenity deck, um, you know, is uh, looks a little bit taller than the, the building across the street. Um, but we're really activating this corner of the project. And by activating that corner, we're able to um, just bring a lot more life and interest uh, to the project in a key location, but really kind of celebrating the idea that this is the public area and then it becomes much more private and residential as it goes down the street. Um, and I just put this up in here as well. This is the, um, the landscape uh, slide, but I uh, wanted to show it um, because it's doing a, a, uh, some additional things to kind of continue with our theme. You know, our theme was motion for this project, which made sense because we're on the train tracks and you have locomotion there, you're on a busy street, you have vehicular motion there. And, um, what was neat was is that uh, you know, they came through and they actually enhanced the sidewalks. So all the sidewalks are being ripped out and they're being enhanced with, a, with enhanced paving. And you can start to see it and you know, it's grayed out on this image because this particular image was just about the courtyards, but the, it was to have this kind of train track motif of you know, different colored paving as you come all the way around. And we were able to bring that on Commonwealth 
and then really all the way around um, onto Williamson as well and onto Chestnut. So we have enhanced sidewalks that will all be tree-lined. Um, don't let this graphic fool you. There, all, this, all the streets will be tree-lined. Um, and then you have these great, wonderful courtyards that are going to be uh, feeding out into these streets that add a lot of green and a lot of pop and a lot of softness uh, to the overall architecture. And so you end up um, with a, a more finalized rendering of, um, of what the building is going to look like. And so this is a shot from Commonwealth that, um, uh, that shows our retail edge, um, you know, in here, and we've intentionally pulled um, the, you know, the first floor back a bit so the building kind of overhangs it, but it creates space for gathering, for outdoor seating. Um, this is sized appropriately for like a coffee shop or a sandwich shop or something like that. It'll ultimately be up to um, the, uh, you know, the, the developer, landowner, and, and who they're able to lease uh, for this space. Um, but then you've also got on top, you've got this um, great amenity deck with an actual amenity for the residents that feeds out onto that. But then you also have all these residences that are also kind of peeking into all these spaces that make it a really fun and dynamic corner. And then you can see how as you go down the street, um, you've got a very public edge with our boxcars, our angled boxcars kind of going down the street and creating even a lot of movement. Uh, up and down um, along the street because of uh, pulling out a lot of the four-story mass that was along there. And as you hop over to uh, Williamson, uh, again, as you can see, more of the refined uh, model uh, where we're able to have that uh, enhanced paving on the speed table that goes between the streets and the idea of really kind of elongating that. We, again, this will be tree-lined, but we took the trees out because um, as architects, we like to see the building. Um, but the idea is of being able to really um, make these open spaces feel even larger than they are. And they are fairly large for this uh, size of building. Um, there's going to be approximately 290 um, units on this. It's a, common, it's a variation of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and a small amount of three bedroom plans. Um, and so there will be more than 290 people uh, that, that ultimately live here. Um, but we wanted these spaces to very, feel very open and very usable, um, and not just to our residents, but you know, to the public as they're coming through these areas as well. Um, and then this is Chestnut. You know, and the idea on Chestnut is we were making that transition to feel more residential. And we wanted our buildings to you know, have almost more of that brownstone kind of feel uh, where they, um, you know, their homes that are joined together and these are, you know, this is a three-story edge that's along here. Um, you can start to see the enhanced materials we have with the wood and uh, with the stone and our, our front stoop entries. Um, so people could have that front door access um, and really trying to make this whole, uh, whole street feel very, very residential and fit well within the community. Um, and then because we're architects, we believe in, um, for what we call four-sided architecture. So uh, we don't believe that there's ever a backside. So even though we do have a side that uh, faces the railroad tracks, we thought it would be a real fun opportunity to exploit that. And so because we have our garage that faces up against the train tracks, uh, we thought, wouldn't it be fun to actually expose the circulation of the garage so that you can see the cars moving up and down in the garage, as well as the train going back and forth. Uh, there's about 17,000 commuters that use uh, the train that come through Fullerton every day. Um, so this is, uh, we felt a very um, public edge that needed to be explored. And so um, there'll also be a mural that would be painted on, on the garage. This is just something we, we placed uh, as a placekeeper, um, these uh, boxcar, um, uh, pieces as a mural. Ultimately, uh, uh, an artist will be hired to uh, paint a mural uh, on the building, and I'm not certain what that will ultimately be, but um, uh, we thought it was just a fun opportunity to kind of look at um, if you were coming from the train, coming from Los Angeles or um, from San Diego, um, seeing something uh, of interest along the backside as well. Um, you know, so as we 
as we kind of you know finish the case study, you know the things that kind of the we call the the key takeaways. Um, you know, so we talked about there's there's um, uh, we need more housing to really meet um, the needs, the future needs that are currently being offset, uh, and just creating uh, larger and larger gaps, which in turn create um, uh, just uh, higher housing costs and higher, higher rents. Um, and so we need to be able to develop more housing at a, at a higher density. Um, but it needs to be density done right, uh, density done in, in areas that, um, that work well with density. I think at times we can, we can see a site that um, has been that, you know, it's been a car dealership forever um, and we get used to it and, and putting an apartment building on there is going to be very different. Uh, and there's no way around it. It's going to be very different. Um, it's not going to be a big parking lot with a one-story building on it, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be bad. Uh, in this case, I, I believe that it's going to uh, enhance the neighborhood quite a bit. Um, uh, it's getting, we're also, not only are we getting a place for new residents to live, but we're upgrading streets and upgrading landscaping all through that area, which will have a positive impact um, on all the surrounding neighbors as well. Um, uh, you know, alternate means of transportation, I think, should always be taken into consideration when we are looking at multifamily housing um, and whether that's using Uber um, or riding a bike um, or riding a scooter, um, you know, to get to a, to a train station or do, to downtown. Uh, not everybody tends to use a car. Not everybody uh, tends to work um, a nine to five job. And, uh, and as many of us are discovering, uh, uh, we can work from home if we have to, and a lot of people do work from home. And so, um, and a lot of these people also live in apartments. And so uh, those, are, I, those are things that we need to consider when uh, we're thinking about um, multifamily housing and that, um, and ultimately density doesn't mean um, uncomfortable living conditions. You know, it doesn't mean uncomfortable living conditions for the people that live there. And it doesn't mean, um, you know, uh, an unsightly uh, building that's going to impact um, neighborhoods in a negative way. Um, you know, I, I didn't really talk much about, I talked more about how I came about with the, with the building, with the architecture, because that's what I do. But, um, you know, one of the things that did come up on this project was, um, was traffic and, um, um, and the amount of parking that was uh, provided. And on um, apartment projects like this, we typically provide about a 1.8 ratio of parking. So for every unit, there's about 1.8 parking stalls. Uh, this project is parking more than that. It parks at uh, 2.0 on average, which is two parking stalls for every unit, which is probably more than is needed. Um, I guarantee you that when a project is built, if you, uh, uh, and they're at uh, maximum occupancy, which is usually about 95% full, um, if you go and look at their garage, they're going to have a lot of open parking um, because uh, not everybody has two cars, um, you know, for uh, for their for their uh, residences, and so and a lot of people will use um, uh, different means to, uh, to be able to get around. So um, it's a very different lifestyle, um, one that I lived until uh, I got married and started a family. So um, I do speak from some experience. So, but. Um, but yeah, it's uh, density done right can uh, really create a sense of community and belonging uh, within the residents uh, that live there. But um, also, if the product is done right, um, be a real benefit to uh, to the surrounding community as well. So um, that kind of concludes my presentation. And I know I, I spoke pretty quickly, but um, if anybody has any questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see me, and um, maybe we can do a little Q&A time to uh, kind of talk to it. Hey, I see Victor. Hi, Victor. How are you? <laughs> Doing good, Paul. How are you? I'm good. So, if, anybody, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, you're welcome to, we're fairly small, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just ask your question, or if you'd feel more comfortable, you can type it into the chat and I'll be happy to monitor that if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask Paul. I have a question. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the opposition that you said you, you had when it came to this project? Sure. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to say that this project was one of the last in a series of projects that had taken place uh, in Fullerton over a few years. Uh, so I had the benefit of uh, being the last guy and, and getting beat up a lot. Um, there had been several, and what I mean by that is that there were several projects that were already under construction um, and, and being built by the time this one came uh, into the city. And so um, there were groups that, um, that were for, well, that, that exist that um, were very opposed to having any multifamily housing um, built in the city of Fullerton. Uh, they were very unhappy with what was being built already. Um, just as a disclaimer, I had nothing to do with those, um, <laughs> nor did my office. Um, but it, uh, so they, they came out in, in uh, protest on, um, to uh, planning commission meetings and city council meetings. Um, uh, several of the meetings, uh, well, the very first meeting I went to, I believe it was planning commission, um, my engineer, uh, civil engineer and I, we both showed up at the same time. Uh, we had a hard time finding a place to park because uh, we were both coming from work. And uh, we were told that we could not enter into, um, uh, into the council chambers because it was full. And uh, we had to go to the public library and we explained, well, no, we're actually presenting tonight. <laughs> so we had to stand um, uh, in the council chambers. And uh, I think for the first hour, uh, we had pretty much, um, you know, one person after the next coming and complaining uh, with, a very, with the same arguments that, you know, we discussed earlier, that this is just going to be very bad for, uh, for the residents. It's going to be very bad for the city as a whole. Um, from there, it did escalate. Um, they, um, uh, they started, uh, well, we, we ultimately uh, did um, get city council approval, but it was after we did some uh, redesigning to the project. We, uh, we gave up uh, five additional dwelling units. So we were originally at, originally this project started at about 316 units. Uh, we, with the developer, we ultimately came down to about 295 units. And uh, I was working with the city, working with the developer, working with the unit mix. Um, and then we gave up five units to create some additional articulation um, along the building to meet um, some of the desires of council members so that they felt that they could approve the project. Um, so the project then was approved, but then um, uh, these groups uh, started a petition to have that rescinded and uh, they needed to um, Need to get a, um, I think it was 10% of registered voters, that amount of people to sign a petition. And then it would be pulled uh, from the approval and pulled back into council. And at that point, the, problem, the project, if that had succeeded, probably would have died um, because there was a lot of pressure. Um, they did not raise that number. Uh, they did raise a lot. Um, it, was, um, it was a well-organized campaign. Um, they, uh, it was um, a lot of volunteers and um, um, hitting the grocery stores, hitting um, places in, in downtown Fullerton and, um, and explaining why they thought the product was, was bad. Um, it had got to a point, I, I, um, one of the stores that they would, uh, they would set up their petitions out in front of is next to um, my, my children's uh, karate dojo. And so, I would take them to karate, I would exercise there, and then I would, um, um, we'd go home. And sometimes we'd swing by the grocery store and uh, pick something up to take home. And um, the, towards the end, the, uh, the, tech, the techniques of those um, out of front of the grocery store were a little more aggressive. Uh, they, were, they were grabbing people by the arm and walking with them as they walked into the store. They were putting a clipboard in front of them and they were saying, this is going to ruin uh, your community and you need to sign this to, to stop it from happening. Um, it was very disappointing uh, because it was one side of the story. Um, our, my client was also out, not as aggressively, um, but, um, but out uh, knocking on doors and 
sharing the other side of the story, which I really respected. I, I appreciated that he did that. Um, and then there's it's three partners and, and they went out and they just said, look, this is what we're trying to do. We think it's a nice thing and this is why we think it's a nice thing. Uh, whereas the opposition was saying, this is a horrible thing and um, it's going to ruin your lives. I mean, really it's pretty much what they were saying. And um, there was no middle ground. Uh, and there was no room for discussion. Um, I did try to have a discussion with one of the, um, uh, one of the opposition uh, leaders. Um, she just scowled at me. <laughs> and, um, and she didn't want to hear anything I had to say. Um, when my client spoke with her, um, her, her conditions were, um, she didn't think that it should be anything above um, like a three-story townhome and that it should provide uh, additional parking for uh, all the surrounding um, residents uh, who didn't have enough parking in their garages. It was a very unrealistic demand, but it was essentially her way of saying, I'm not gonna support you no matter what you do. Thank you for that. I'm pretty familiar with those kinds of situations and I know that getting ahead of that narrative is so important and glad to see the developer was doing some of that. Yeah, they had been very proactive. They had, um, they had hit the streets uh, very early on. Uh, they even talk about the project with the surrounding, surrounding neighborhoods. They wanted people to be in the loop and they wanted to get, um, they wanted to get feedback. Uh, this particular developer is really hands-on. Uh, some developers aren't. Some developers are much larger organizations and they wanna come in and they're gonna, they're gonna build something there. And, and, you know, and some of them don't wanna be told, no, uh, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, this particular group is a smaller group. Uh, they're great guys, and um, they they wanted to do a project that fit. Um, I've never had a developer come to me and say, um, "Paul, I want you to design me a building that you think is appropriate for this site, and then you tell me um, how many units you get." But that's what they did, and that's that's the only client I've ever had to do that. Um, which was what I think made the project so incredibly special. Uh, and they knew that I lived there and, um, uh, and they, they knew that I would be very passionate about what was going to go there. And, uh, and they were very supportive of that, so. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions I'd like to ask? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, so again, thank you for you know being able to speak to all of us. Really appreciate it. My question is: so, I've been listening to the podcast uh, for the writer of this book called um, uh, "Not Public Defenders," but um, I I think it's Neighborhood Defenders. Okay. And they're talking about how um, you know allowing too much too much control by the too much input from the from a specific community uh, can shut down projects that are very desperately needed. Uh, and as someone who has faced a lot of, uh, you know, has been in the forefront of battles for projects like these, um, how do you, how do you, what do you feel is the, is there like the, the Goldilocks section uh, uh, <laughs> that people, that a, a community uh, can work towards or like we can, you know, we as public planners can try to, foster within our communities to push for more developments? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, it's, well, it's actually an easy question. It's a tough answer um, because, yeah, where, where do you draw that, where do you draw that line? Uh, you know, I talked about how I've been working on this project since 2015. So it's, it's been a five year journey um, and it, this project won't be complete until, you know, the end of this year or sometime, you know, first quarter of next year. Um, so it takes a long time to do these, and there's there's a reason why there, it takes a long time. Um, you know, California has a lot of regulations that um, really do slow the amount of development. Um, it keeps it at that kind of eighty thousand units uh, a year kind of pace because of that. Um, uh, but another thing that has popped up has been um, public opposition, right? Um, uh, people that can form groups and form organizations that can oppose the project and uh, and they're they're being vocal and they're being active uh, does have an impact on um, on getting housing built um, at the same time I was doing this project I was also doing a project in Northern California uh, it's very similar it's on two uh, it's on 
it's on, it's two buildings. It's on the same site. Um, but it is split by a, um, what we call a, a public park. Um, and it is next to, it's in Fremont. So it's next to the BART station. Um, it's it's uh, much closer than our project in Fullerton is to mass transit. Uh, it's less than a quarter of a mile. So it's, it's walkable. And um, it had a very big public outcry against it as well. And it was, again, was a four story, three and four story building. Uh, it was not very dense. It was actually less dense than what the Fullerton project is. Uh, but still same arguments and same outcry. And that, that uh, outcry actually um, delayed the project in getting built. It almost derailed the project from getting built. Uh, in the end, the developer, they had come in at about 53 units per acre. Uh, they were allowed to build 80 units per acre per the zoning code. Um, but they were building 53. 50 was the minimum that they were allowed to build. Uh, they ultimately backed down to 50. They gave up uh, 80 apartment uh, dwellings to get um, council approval on it because the um, the pressure from the surrounding residents, uh, surrounding community was uh, so fierce that um, politicians honestly were, were worried about being voted out of office, about losing their jobs. And, um, and it was an election year as well to top it off. Um, so I think that we have to weigh that balance of, um, I believe that people have a right to be vocal and to share their thoughts and their beliefs. Um, and I, don't, I believe that's a, a right that we have in America and it should not be taken away. But um, we have to also have it set up um, in a way that it is done um, appropriately and properly. Um, and I'm not exactly certain what that is, to be quite honest with you. Um, I, I don't want to take people's rights away in any way, shape, or form. But um, when arguments are based solely on um, fear uh, or a misunderstanding, um, it's a very hard argument to have because uh, you're no longer dealing um, you're no longer dealing with facts. You're dealing with feelings and emotions and um, Sometimes those need to be removed in order to look at things objectively. And um, quite often that's what we try to do. And we are trying to diffuse the situation by saying, we understand where you're coming from, but let us explain why your fears are unfounded. Uh, I don't say it like that because I'd be rude, but, um, <laughs> but you want to show that, you know, the fears that they're feeling, they're valid feelings, but, it may not necessarily be fact. And so if we can get people from feeling to fact and people to understand um, that their lives are not necessarily going to be impacted so negatively that um, I'm taking something away from them and instead I'm actually adding value to their neighborhood and to their city, um, maybe we could get people to change their mind. But typically, um, Myself and others, uh, even smarter than, than me, and there's a lot of people that are smarter than me, have been unsuccessful in uh, kind of communicating that because there's, a, there's just a really large amount of feelings that are in there that we just don't seem to be able to break through. I have a question, if I can ask a question. Um, sure. I, I'm trying to figure out if I should unmute. Un, oh, here I am. Hi. So, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, speaking to what you're just saying about how a lot of very smart people, smarter than us, have tried to have a conversation with folks who were very worried that their lives would be upended or somehow negatively impacted and that um, it hasn't been very successful. What type of messaging do you think that we as advocates um, or would be advocates can share with electeds that um, would help them have some courage and know that people are behind them um, and that, you know, give them the courage to do the right thing? Because electeds, yeah. I mean, if they don't know now that we have a housing shortage, they haven't been paying attention because the last two years has <laughs> been legislation, you know, from. Yes. Yeah. So yes, anyway, we have legislation from on high right now saying right. that, you know, you're going to provide a certain amount of affordable housing or we're just going to let them bypass your your process. Right. Right. And, and that has that has a lot of people 
nervous. Um, not not developers, but a lot of cities nervous. Like they're like, no, we have a process in place for a reason. So, yeah, it's being made known. Um, but I I think that you know one of the things is is that when something is deemed as unpopular, um, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of people that will band together and be very vocal about it. Um, but I think that we also can be if we're if we're okay with the way things are, uh, we tend to be very passive. We we tend to uh, not be as vocal about it. And that can be a perception um, from, you know, uh, uh, from our, our elected officials that um, the people that are the loudest are possibly the majority. Um, I found that typically the people that are the loudest tend to be the minority. Um, and that the people that uh, the majority tends to just not say much <laughs> because they're comfortable with the status quo or what or how things are going. Um, it would be great to be able to get more people um, that are that are more in favor, um, or even even if they're not in favor, um, that they're not opposed um, to things taking place in the city, right? Uh, especially with the building of housing, um, because I would love it if um, our elected officials didn't feel like well, if I don't, if I don't, you know, support um, this group that's anti-housing, um, you know, they might band together and vote me out of office on the, on the next election. I don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's a very real possibility of being an elected official, right? But um, it, it's, it's one of those things, if it is the, the vast minority of people, then I believe that the vast majority of people if they feel like you're doing a good job, we'll, we'll keep you in office. And so sometimes there needs to be that, that confidence of, um, you know, you're, you're, by doing the right thing, most of us are gonna be happy uh, that you're doing the right thing. And um, most of us are gonna be happy that, you know, if we're providing housing to where, uh, when our kids grow up um, and they need, a, they need a place to live, that they're gonna be able to live in the same city and the same community and not have to move further and further away from from, from us, right? Or that, um, you know, teachers and firemen and policemen um, are gonna be able to have an affordable place to live. Um, I think that most people would, would agree that that's a good thing. Um, so I don't know if I thoroughly answered your, your question there or not, Elizabeth, but um, it, it's a tough position. I, I'm, not, I'm not an elected official. And so I can only imagine the pressure that they must be under on you know, each time one of these projects come in. They know that they know the other other side of it, you know, um, new construction and, and new housing and new retail are all good for the city. Um, they all bring in revenue, right? Um, it's it, it keeps our city running. Those are those are great things, and they, and they know that and they want that, um, but they want to make sure that um, everybody is is happy with that. And sometimes that's just not the case. Okay, um, so it's exactly 730 and we had said that we would keep this to an hour. Is there anybody that wants to ask a last last question before I say thank you to Paul? Uh, I think uh, Deborah on the text and the um, had a question. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm seeing the chat. There's a few okay. questions on the chat. Um, so one question is, what is the cost of housing units in this type of project and how does that impact the cost of rent and housing prices in the area that it's being built? Yeah, great question. So um, um, remember we talked about it being a, a case of supply and demand. Um, and so uh, when, you, when you hear the cost of an apartment uh, unit in Orange County, um, you're like, oh my gosh, how can somebody afford that? How can somebody afford a $3,000 rent for a one bedroom unit, right? And the answer is, is that um, that's what the market will bear because if the market wouldn't bear that, uh, then they wouldn't be asking that for rent. Um, the reason why um, they're so expensive um, is because we have such low, um, um, a low amount of housing to provide. And so that drives the price up. Um, and it's not, it's not an easy, that's an easy answer. And it's, it's not an easy answer because uh, land costs are expensive for the developer to buy the land. And it's because there's not as much land. And so they can ask for more money for it. Uh, construction costs 
um, are high because um, it's a booming economy. And so there's not as much of the trades to go around. And so they can ask for more. Um, and so they do. So there's all these things that go into um, making the project more expensive. Um, this, uh, my client, Alex, told me that, um, you know, the land value uh, at the time, uh, just the land was probably worth around five to six million dollars. Um, once the project was developed, it would be worth over a hundred million dollars. Um, and you're like, wow, that's an incredible return. But the amount of money that has to be spent to actually build the project, to buy the land, to build the project, um, to pay all the consultants, you know, the architects, the engineers, the landscape architects, the um, you know, not only structural, but civil engineers and the dry utilities that have to go in and then all the construction trades that are building it. Uh, these buildings are incredibly expensive. Um, and then if the lender or if the uh, developer is a small developer, uh, then they need a lender uh, to lend them the money to be able to do all of this. And that lender will have expectations written into their agreement that says, I'm going to make X percent on this deal. So the lender gets paid before the developer does. And so all these things come into play to where everybody has to be able to get paid and make a little bit of a profit. Um, and in the end, because we don't have enough housing, um, we have rents that are really, really high. And so I know in the Fulton project, you're gonna be probably looking at you know, uh, $3,000 rents for like a one bedroom. And uh, I think that's nuts, I really do. But, um, but they wouldn't be asking that if they weren't able to get that. Um, an apartment project will always look, they would love to be 100% occupied at all times, uh, but typically if they are 95% occupied at all times, um, they're doing phenomenal. But that's, that's kind of the sweet spot for them because that means you know, they have people moving in and out throughout the year, but if they can maintain that, um, then they're going to uh, be profitable. So they will, um, they will gear their rents in a way to make sure that they're maintaining about a 95% occupancy. Anybody else? No? Paul, thank you so much. This was, this was great. I really, um, I really appreciate your time and um, the thought that went into putting this together and um, really appreciate what you've done uh, in your work and representing density in the context of a suburban location and doing it well and being a great ambassador for building more housing. Well, thanks so much for having me. I mean, this was a lot of fun and I could talk about this kind of stuff all day long. So I apologize if I went long, but um, no, no problem. Yeah. Love, uh, love what you guys are doing. Love that you guys um, are in support of not only housing, but housing policy and all that kind of nerdy stuff that I think is fantastic. And uh, I love what you guys are doing and I love that you guys are here. So thanks for having me. And um, if I can help in any way or answer questions in any way, I'd love to. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who uh, stayed until the very end. We, we had uh, at our top, I think we had like 28 people tuning in. So this is great. I'm That's really great. grateful for all of your time and uh, your expertise and I um, hope everyone found it helpful. and. If you're not a member of People for Housing, you can become a member on our website. It's www.peopleforhousing.org. And with that, I will say thank you and I hope everyone has a good night.